Right, folks. Okay, here we go. Um, back visiting probably the uh, the most serious topic of all um, when it comes to, to mental health, and that is uh, we're talking about suicide again. So we've done this a couple of times already. The first time we spoke about it was with um, Professor Rory O'Connor, where we looked at it from kind of a, an academic perspective, a bit of a sort of a brief introduction to the topic as a whole. Then we spoke to Jenny McCartney from the Samaritans and the the, the sort of the, the art of, of, of dealing with and, and speaking to people who are uh, severely depressed and suicidal. Um, and today, and a uh, different angle, we're going to be talking to someone who's actually lost a family member to suicide. So my guest today is Paul McGregor. Paul is a mental health advocate and speaker who travels the country to raise awareness of issues related to suicide. He is the host of the Paul McGregor podcast, the author of Man Up, Man Down, Standing Up to Suicide. And if you're a, a bit of a scruffy twat like me, you, you might be interested to know he's also the founder of mensfashionmagazine.com and a short course lecturer at the London College of Fashion. So, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. No worries. Great to finally be here. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> where to start with this? I think a good place to start with this would be just to let everybody know, people are sort of conscious with these sort of conversations um, as they're listening to them about whether the interview is maybe being a bit too intrusive. Um, and so just to let everybody know that we've spoken briefly beforehand and I've, I've, I've checked with the what it is you are and aren't comfortable with talking about. So um, <laughs> just to let everybody know, like if they're listening, like, oh God, that's a bit close to the bone. You've agreed that pretty much, you know, anything, open exactly. to, to talking about anything, yeah? Yeah, we'll talk about it more, I'm sure, as the episode goes on. But yeah, I'm pretty much an open book when it comes to to talking about this this now. Right, okay, good. Well, you're going to have to be open because <laughs> before we jump into this, so I always like to start all my interviews with a bit of a, a sort of a brief introduction about how people came to study what they're studying or be an activist in, in their particular area. But before we, we go there with you, I can't let you get away with this. You used to be a rapper. <laughs> I don't know if you want to call it that, but... <laughs> so I've, you've got to tell us a little bit about that first, because if we're going to go right the way back, let's start I mean, with... I look, I look like your typical <clears throat> MC. Do you remember you remember the MC days? Like, do you remember like garage music, all of that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, I was about... How old was I? 13, 14, and we all used to do it at school. But you was actually... You was pretty good, because I mean, you was, yeah, that, it, the, you was the, in a competition, the, wasn't you? Yeah, like everyone was like, oh, you're quite good, Paul. And then I just did more and more and more. And then I, I released like a CD and then um, this independent label in Cornwall, like a, a hip hop, UK hip hop label picked it up. And um, I like signed a piece of paper and I was like, I've got a record deal and all of this. But um, it, I think I, I don't know, I think I sold over a thousand CDs at one point. And yeah, then, then the competition was a plan B competition. Um, yeah. And I come, I come second. And Maverick Saber is the guy who won, and he's gone on to be extremely famous. So you've got what was your claim to fame. what was your uh, MC name? Minus. M was it MC minus or just minus? Yeah. I think it was just it was just minus. Yeah, because I was always I think it was, I don't know why it was minus, but <laughs> it used to be Messiah as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll scrap that one. Right. Well, that's it. So uh, I'll say I read that you you dropped yourself in it there because that's on your website on your on your little bit of uh, little bits about you. So I was like, I'm not letting him get away with that. Uh, I might I might make a comeback in that one. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, but yeah. Now seriously. Now what's the what what is the um what's your story and just give us sort of a brief overview because we're gonna we're gonna pass it out and go a bit deeper into it but um so you work in in, in suicide um and, and anti-suicide activism however you want to call it and um just tell us a, yeah a brief history of how you came to be, be doing this yeah sure so um i always kind of explain it as the first 18 years of my life was not easy, but it was looking back at it now, it was quite carefree. Um, I was always very outgoing at school, always quite confident. I, you know, played football and all the kind of, you know, typical things that you'd come to expect. But even though I was very outgoing, actually, I was actually very insecure. And looking back at it now, actually, I was probably struggling with a bit of anxiety, worrying what people thought of me. Um, but aside from that, there was no real kind of issues. And, and the story is, is of my dad and someone who, again, 
no signs of any mental illness, no signs of any depression. Um, was a full-time engineer, part-time physiotherapy business that he ran from home. He was a really good sort of runner. He was physically healthy. Um, just one day had a, the only way I explain it is a, is a breakdown and just changed his behaviors drastically overnight. Um, showed some signs of suicide, but not saying it, just kind of, I, I don't know whether I can carry on. And it was completely out of the blue. So we didn't really know what to do. Um, so he went to the doctors, got help got some antidepressants and then a couple of days later went back, got some more. And then a couple of days later, he attempted suicide for the first time. And that was the biggest shock because that was literally my dad changing behaviors. And then I think it was like seven days later attempting suicide. Um, and looking at that now, if he would have actually, we always talk about this as a family, if he would have died on that occasion, I think it would have been a lot harder to actually process. But when my dad came out of the hospital, we kind of thought the nightmare was over. He denied that it was suicide. He blamed it on the medication. Suicidal thoughts is one of the side effects of antidepressants in the first two weeks. And um, we thought the nightmare was over. But again, the nightmare kind of got worse because my dad got worse. He ended up being sectioned in a mental health unit as well. And he spent a couple of months in there. And that was my personal and my family's pers personal experience and exposure to mental illness. You know, we'll talk about it more, but this mental health unit was five minutes from where we lived. I didn't even know it was there because that's like literally like where you would never expect my family or me or my dad or anyone to kind of be. And there my daddy is kind of sitting um, in the sort of, you know, in the ward and there's people with psychosis, bipolar, schizophrenia, et cetera. Um, but he came out of that and he seemed, he seemed a bit better, but actually, you know, he wasn't. It was just kind of him bottling it up again and wearing that mask and then yeah he he took his life shortly after that on the 4th of March 2009 um and yeah it was it was horrible because at that time it's like you're not expecting it to happen but there was always that fear in the back of your mind every time you woke up like is dad gonna actually be alive today um but then when it actually happened it was actually horrible to deal with and um yeah personally I dealt with it terribly like just bottled it up went clubbing sort of six days after just distraction, 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 distraction. I'm a man. I'm not going to show any emotion. And yeah, that's, that's kind of where it all started. What made you make the leap from just somebody that this had, had affected to like, right, I'm going to fucking do something about this and, and, and start getting involved in, in mental health and activism. Yeah, it took, it took ages. So um, like I always kind of explain it as when it happened, I, I didn't really talk to anyone for a good, year or two like I tried counseling in that time I tried you know a psychiatrist I think in that time apart from sort of chatting every now and then to like my mum about it um and when I'm actually completely off my face drunk maybe showing a bit of emotion to my mates then because that's like when I can um I didn't really speak to anyone about it so then kind of um about two years later I actually got some really really good help from a lady called Anne and she was the first person that actually got me to open up and was the start of the process of me actually grieving and dealing with it and then I still was like head down working on it myself processing it for the next four four or five years and then I shared an article about three years ago online and then you know it was only a, probably about until a year ago I actually went all in on it and so you know there was a few things of why I did it one of the reasons was I wanted to help people like my dad um, the second reason why I did it at that time is I felt ready to, and I wanted to kind of hopefully, um, help people that were in that situation. And the third reason why I do more of it now is because of becoming a dad and, um, seeing the suicide rates amongst young people and actually thinking I, I need to do something more than the fashion business that I was running at the time. Right. Okay. Well, Plenty There's a lot to, there. Yeah, plenty, plenty, <laughs> plenty to dig into. <clears throat> but I, what I'd like to start with is, um, <clears throat> so you mentioned that your dad had no real signs of uh, of depression before this this period. Um, it's it sort of kicked in suddenly. Um, but you mentioned that that was at the time. Um, I'm just wondering if retrospectively, maybe you've dug into the history a, a little bit. Whether your dad had, had had any problems prior to this, or was it actually just uh, something out of the blue yeah of course and, and, and that's that's a good question because I always that's the way I explain it because that's the way that it happened for us 
but that's not the way it happened for my dad. Like, I, I don't know, but my dad never just woke up that day and was, I'm now suicidal. He, I'm sure he had those emotions, those thoughts for a long, 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 long time. But he just felt like he couldn't tell anyone, like, you know, because of the stigma, because of everything around it. He probably felt like he couldn't tell anyone that he was having these feelings, these emotions. Also as well, you know, looking back at it, looking at who my dad was as a man, um, there was definitely some sort of things that kind of stand out to me as well in terms of, you know, he was very sensitive. He worried what people thought of him. He was a social perfectionist. I know you, you mentioned Rory. Rory kind of helped me with this as well. Understanding social perfectionism, my dad had to make sure everything looked great on the outside, I think, to probably protect what he was feeling on the inside. And then as well, I don't know, I'm just sort of, by the more knowledge that I've got now, I think my dad struggled with maybe um, OCD as well, because my dad was very obsessive. Like he had to go for a run every day. And there was a time when my mum explained that she'd just given birth to my brother and she was desperate for help. And she says, he was like, I'm going for a run. And she was simply, no, you're not. If you go for a run, that's it. And um, he went for a run. And, <laughs> you know, my dad wasn't like a, a nasty person. He wasn't like a manipulator in any way. But like my dad had to go for a run that day and every day. And then he had to write in his book and all of this. And looking at that back then, I just thought my dad was a keen athlete. I just thought he was like, you know, but meeting people with OCD and intrusive thoughts and I now question, did my dad have that as well? I'm not sure. But yeah, 100%, as the question was, he definitely had those feelings prior to what we saw. Do you mind sharing what it was that was the catalyst for this severe episode of depression? I don't know. And this is the whole, this is the whole reason why I struggled to deal with it. Right. Because I just, it was like, why have you done it? Like, you know, it was very much without any understanding of depression and suicide, I, I held a lot of hatred towards him after he died. And that's a horrible thing to say because you've just lost your dad who was, you know, the most amazing dad that I could have ever wished for. But it was very much the complete lack of understanding around it. it was like, why have you done it? Like, did you not love us? You know, or, and all of these kind of questions that surrounded it because there was no, there was nothing that I could put my finger on that could have caused it. But there was a lot of potential. It could have been this. He lost a bit of money in the stock market. My dad was not rich in any way. He was a hardworking guy that was very tight with his money. Um, he was obsessed with money again. Um, and he lost a little bit of money in the stock market. And, you know, could that have been it? Could it have been something going on at work? He'd just changed jobs and he was working nights. I, I really don't know. And um, the one thing that helped me actually move forward was accepting that I'll never know. Um, wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's tricky. I was just, because when you sort of mentioned, um, when you were telling the story, then the, there seemed to be a very, uh, sort of abrupt change in him, in his demeanor. Yeah. Um, and so it was that just purely sort of, because obviously you can't, without knowing what the, the particular event or a collection of events was and without you know being able to read his mind you've only got the sort of the subjective o o experience of observing him and his behavior um and it just it seems um what's the word i'm looking for i was gonna say interesting it doesn't seem quite the the, the right word to say that, that somebody would change so so suddenly yeah. overnight that you recognize it and but also without knowing what was was going on behind all that but yeah. is, is that what we're talking it was it was almost like you know he went to bed one guy and, and woke up somebody else almost yeah it, honestly it was and this is the thing that I struggled with as well was like, one of my biggest fears and it was it still is, is is that I'll end up like my dad and you know and that's the the reason why I was scared of that is because of how quick it happened like, you know, literally, as I said, if, if we would have lost him on that first attempt, and he was very, you know, lucky to, to not die on that first attempt, um, it would have been a lot harder to process because we wouldn't have seen the mental health unit. We wouldn't have seen the six months of my dad. Again, I say I lost my dad that day that he broke. Like that whole six months of him still being here wasn't my dad. It was a completely different character. Um, well, so do, do, you mind, do you mind sort of, um, yeah, explaining that like the, yeah. the, the the change between um before and after i mean like what how that manifested the day that it happened the day that he like broke the first time that i and we ever kind of thought something's happened was 
I come home from work and like me and my dad were always like very close. We'd hug, you know, we'd sort of kiss goodnight and stuff. And um, he like come up to me, like hugged me like straight away and like held me for like longer than he's, he's ever held me. And I was a bit, you, you don't, th- again, I don't think anything of it. You know, I just, because, you know, suicide is not meant to happen to us. Like suicide is not meant to affect any of us. It was, it was as simple as that was my lack of understanding around it. And then um, the only other thing that I explain of it, and this is hard unless you've actually been there, his eyes. Like his eyes were just, I don't know. It was just, it was just distance. There was, it was like I was looking at someone else. Um, and then just the, what he was saying, like, um, I don't feel like I can carry on. And, you know, you know where the money is and, you know, things like that. And um, I can't remember all of it, but I remember leaving him and being a bit, that was strange, but still suicide never questioned him. Like it was never in my mind. It was literally, okay, maybe dad needs to go to the doctors and dad will bounce back. Like dad will, dad will be fine. Um, but yeah. And, and also through that eight, through that six month period, it, I always mention it eyes, like just, there was one time it was four days before he died and he was the worst that I'd ever seen him. And looking in his eyes, it sounds strange saying this. It was almost like he was possessed. Like mm. it was just not him. He was, he was angry. He was not violent, but you know, he, he got a bit violent towards me because I stopped him from like leaving the room. Like, that's just not my dad. My dad never had a fight in his life. He wasn't a violent man or, and any of that. And his eyes were just, yeah, something else. And, and, it, and it, that's the scary thing of how quick it happened. Yeah. Was the, um, <clears throat> during that six month period, was it, um, was it sort of a, was it a constant decline or was there any, you know, any sort of comeback, be it through, you know, self-help or seeing a therapist or, be the, the the medication or anything yeah there was there was there was definitely there was there was a bounce back when he came out of hospital and even in hospital like as well i've never really spoke about this much but my dad's accident caused him to be in a coma for you know i think it was like five days so you're you're trying to process that as well like has dad just attempted suicide he's also in a coma now so we've you know is he ever going to wake up um and I think emotionally that affected us more than we've probably ever imagined. Um, but essentially when my dad um, sort of came round, he like denied it. Like, and literally as well, my dad went from being in a coma to like the next day we walked in there and he's sitting upright, like mm. eating breakfast. And we were just like, wow, like this is a miracle. Like literally, um, and he was just denying it. Like, no, of course I would never have done that. Um, blaming it on the medication so I think that then was like this huge relief for all of us like wow like dad's not only survived this accident he's recovered physically but he's also denied that that was ever the case and he's never going to do it again so like that was a big big relief from all of us the other relief as well was um when he actually come out of the mental health unit he um he just he seemed better like my dad was in a mental health unit because he felt suicidal and he actually rung up and wanted to be sectioned himself. And right. when he first went in there, it was very much, you're not allowed to even leave this small ward. Like it's literally locked. And we used to go and see him every, every day. And it wasn't a nice environment, like horrible, horrible environment. Um, then after about a couple of weeks or something, my dad's then allowed into the canteen in the, in the unit still. And then it's now you're allowed out of the unit only into the main hospital but you've got to come back to the unit at these certain times and then it was like you're allowed maybe to go into the town but you've still got to come back um and then it was like you're allowed out so we saw my dad gradually get better I remember I drove after work to go and see him and we like walked to the main hospital we had like dinner in the canteen together and then like seeing my dad walk back to the mental health unit like my dad was a lot better then um, and then coming out again, my, my dad seemed better. He was watching me play football one day and I was like, you know, it's amazing that dad's back. Um, he came out for a meal for my brother's 21st birthday. All of this kind of happened and it all seemed to be going okay. Um, but again, what's what's really key about that story is my dad was keeping a journal that we didn't know at the time, but after he died, we found it. And in all of those moments, he was writing about how bad he felt. Um and, you know, we were like, dad was getting back to normality, but he was writing down how terrible he felt amongst all of it as well. Um, 
Right, I've, I've got this question. I don't, I don't know if it's sort of, it's sort of conscious of things veering into the, um, what's the word, sort of the the, the sensationalist. But um, I'm interested in sort of the, the specifically the the 48 hour period, um, before and and after, um, he finally took his own life, um, and what that sort of, if you could sort of go through that sort of narratively um, from start to finish for you, whether they felt like there was any, um, like a, a real big build up, like in retrospect, it was like, yeah, that, that, you know, that might've been the day uh, of all the days that was going to be the day. And uh, also how you found out and um, just that, that entire, that entire experience. Yeah. Um, so my dad, the, the day that my dad got a little bit aggressive and, as I said, possessed was a Saturday. And he was staying at my nan and granddad's at the time because he just wanted to be there. So me and my mum went down in the morning because my granddad said, you know, he had a bad night. And um, I went up to the room to kind of see him. And, and you know, he was in he was in the bed and he was like in a like huddled up position. And I was trying to talk to him and I just wasn't getting anything out of him. And then he was just desperate to go for a run. Like he was just, like, I want to go for a run. I want to go for a run. Um, and then that's why I like kind of stopped him and was like, no, you're not going for a run. You need to stay here. And he got a little bit violent, nothing like just literally, you know, not, not like physically violent, but you could just see he was like, you know, not himself. And then he sat back down on the bed and then like my real dad kicks in and um, he kind of just stayed on the bed and was like, okay, so I rung an ambulance and essentially, you know, there's so much to the story, but um, the ambulance took him to another hospital and then um, I stayed with him for a long time and then managed to get him transported to the mental health unit again. And then I was like, you know, he's in the mental health unit, he's safe. Um, and then the next kind of day, which was the Sunday, I rung, I rung him in the unit and he was just it was a horrible conversation because he was just broken. Like he was crying down the phone. He was, um, you know, just, yeah, he was broken. And then the Monday, we saw him on the Sunday as well and he just wasn't right. And then the Monday um, I went to work because I, I just started like my first real kind of corporate job, or if you want to call it that. And um, I had a phone call from my granddad and he was like, I've just gone and picked dad up. Like he's been discharged. And I was very much like, what do you mean he's been discharged? He's literally just, he was the worst he's been for ages. And he was in there Saturday and now he's out sort of two days later. And my mum felt the same. My brother felt the same. But my granddad and my nan, again, this is a whole new sort of story in itself. Obviously, they're the older generation. They didn't understand any of this. So like for them, they're like, oh, okay, we'll go pick him up. And I don't blame them for it at all. So he then went back to my nan and granddad's. I drove straight there from from work on the Monday night. And um, I saw him on the Monday night and he was just a mess. Like, um, I'll never be the same dad ever again. Um, all of this. And this is the, the, the guilt I've always, always carried because um, my I was saying to myself, I've got to do something like, it's just not acceptable. He should have stayed in the mental health unit. He should never have been discharged. Like they've discharged him thinking that he's okay. And he's obviously not. Like he's the worst he's ever been. Um, but this is like, as I say, six months in and I was drained. Like literally that Saturday of trying to get him into the, to the unit was just a nightmare in itself. It was like literally arguing with like nurses and arguing with everyone to try and get him into the unit. So now he's out again. It was very much like, what can we do? Like, I, I just don't know what we can do anymore. Um, and I had work the next morning. So it was like, you know what? I'm going to go home, get some sleep. I'm tired. I'll see dad tomorrow. Um, and yeah, I went to work the next day rung up my granddad and was like how's dad and he was like yeah he's okay he's kind of just in his bedroom about an hour or two later rung up again how's dad um like dad's just gone for a walk and I was just like you have it was a horrible horrible feeling like I I knew that was it but I also didn't want to believe it wow um and um I'm sitting at my desk I'm waiting I'm waiting I'm waiting I ring back like an hour later like how's dad oh he's still not back like another half hour passes, he's still not back. Like another hour passes, he's still not back. And by that time, I think I'd left work. I was like, I've got to go. I've got to try and like get back. Um, my mum had left her work, my brother the same. And we we're all kind of going to my nana granddad's. And um, essentially, yeah, he, he didn't come back. And 
we were kind of looking for him, ringing him, everything. And um, my brother, bless him, like, and my granddad, they went to the police station with a photo. And yeah, he was identified that that was the kind of, you know, he'd been in an accident and um, people have said that it was suicide. Um, and my brother came back with my granddad. Like they never, they didn't ring us or anything because of course they didn't want to tell us over the phone. So my brother came back with my granddad and um, walked in the back door of my nan and granddad's house. Like um, Their neighbor was there and stuff and just said, my granddad was like, that's it, it's done. <laughs> like that's my granddad's, just, that's just his generation. And my brother was like, obviously not emotional, but you could see that he was just white and shocked. Um, and yeah, I just broke down in tears. I punched like my nan and granddad's kitchen counter. I was just like angry. Um, and then like a couple of hours later, like me and my brother in a fish and chip shop, like trying to order some dinner. Mm. And like the world's just carrying on. Does that make sense? Like, and that's that's the weirdest feeling. The next morning, me and my mum are walking the dog and everyone's like mourning. And like, you know, my mum's just lost her husband. Like I've just lost my dad. And, and then, yeah, kind of what followed after that was literally just numbness, like, yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, I can, I can and I can't imagine it, Paul. Because, um, so my dad died last year, and um, wow. but his was it was a long illness. It was expected. All this I've talked about on the podcast. Everyone knows all this bollocks, anyway. Um, but even even for me in those circumstances, he was in his seventies, long disease, expected. It was it, we saw it coming. I remember that where it was like he died in hospital, and then it was like. Uh, I, you know, I was the one that had to sort of permit the, the doctors to turn the machine off. And then it was like, right, he's gone. Leave the hospital. You go outside. Sunny day. Everybody's going about the business. We go home, um, sit down, grab a drink, put the telly on. And it's, it's fucking weird. And yeah. but, but but for that's what I mean. And, and that's even in those circumstances where it was it was sort of the inevitable outcome. Whereas for you... Um, that's it. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine it, but it's again, it's like, what, what do you, what else do you do? Exactly. Like you just can't, yeah, it's hard to process. And it's so raw. And like all of those emotions that you're feeling back then, I just don't think you can judge any of them because it's like, literally like, you're just on autopilot. And um, there was a bit of media coverage, not like local media coverage around my dad's suicide. So that was something that we all, we had to kind of deal with like the police. Um, and then, as you probably know as well, it's like the first couple of weeks is terrible, but like you're literally like a robot because mm. like you're arranging the funeral. You're like, you know, trying to process it. You're, I don't know, all of that kind of people are messaging you. Like they're finding out they're messaging you friends on the phone and um, people visiting. And it's like, yeah, I found it hard after the funeral to be honest, because that's when you're meant to go back to reality. Yeah, one of mine was um, just feeling like I wasn't upset enough. Like, I felt like I should yeah. be constantly, like, crying and angry and stuff and then feeling guilty because that wasn't that wasn't how I was behaving. Yeah. I and I think because everyone grieves very differently. Like, the people around you, like, someone else might be extremely upset and then you're not and you're like, why am I not upset? And then the yeah. other person is upset. It's like, why is he not upset? And it's just everyone grieves so differently. Yeah, so I want to talk about this a bit about this media coverage. Um, so this is something you've you've covered this on your um, YouTube channel anyway. So I know that you're fine talking about it. Um, so it seems that the it, it was reported in the newspaper the, the following day, mm. and um, you put a, placed a comment underneath the article. I'm just gonna just gonna read that out, which was um, you'll for uh, you'll forever be missed by everyone that knew you, Dad. Um, don't comment on this case if you don't truly understand the situation. My dad should have been kept in hospital for the treatment he deserved. Um, if the hospital would have done their job, um, this could have been prevented. I love you, Dad. You'll never be forgotten, Paul. Um, a couple of things I want to dig into there, really. And the first is um, you were saying, you know, don't comment on this situation if you you, you don't know what's don't truly understand it. What were pe what were people saying uh, about that? What I mean, again, this is the day after. And what are people saying in the comments? Yeah, and it's good that you brought that up because, you know, I remember reading that comment a couple of months ago and I was like, wow, I, di I didn't know I was in that headspace at that time. That was less than 24 hours to say that. But essentially people were commenting sort of saying that, you know, it's selfish. Um, the way my dad took his own life affected someone else was involved. Um, like, you know, uh, it was a road accident. So the driver that was involved, you know, people saying that, you know, 
what a horrible thing to do to this man. He's now got to live with this for the rest of his life. And and we're not disagreeing with that at all. Like, you know, and this is the whole thing that we tried, we, we just couldn't understand back then. Like my dad was a people pleaser. My dad would never put anyone at harm right. or anything like that. So this is why we were struggling to understand that headspace because it's like, you know, my dad would have thought about that if he was actually rationally thinking. Um, people, yeah, just people saying it was selfish. He calls a, he calls a lot of traffic. Um, and people like, oh, I was late for this because of this stupid right. accident and all, all this kind of negativity around it, which is why I sort of put that. And it was good reading through the comments when I did that video, um, I think it was last month or something, where I was reading and there was a few of his friends, few of people that worked for him. And they're kind of saying, like, if you knew Neil, like, you should not be making this judgment. Like, he just wasn't that that person that you'd expect from reading this sort of short 300 word article about it. Um, but I just think that's that's typically what we still believe with with suicide. I'm guessing that you know it is selfish. It's you know it's it's leaving people behind, and they have to then deal with it. Um, and we kind of need to shift away from that in a way and actually understand the situation that those people are in. Yeah, the other thing in that comment is where you say, um, my dad should have been kept in hospital for the treatment he deserved. If the hospital would have done the job, this could have been prevented. Um, and it's, it's something you were said quite a lot, especially in these circumstances where someone takes their own life, is th th this idea of being let down by the system. And um, I'm just wondering what um, well, what you mean sp specifically in, in, in your dad's um, circumstances, because it... It's one of them sort of tricky ones that brings us to the the whole issue of people sort of being detained and detained maybe against the will and things like that. And um, I'm not. I've I've had I've had this conversation a few times with a few different people, and I'm still not sure where I I stand on that when somebody's been you know somebody is acutely suicidal, whether they should be sort of detained for their own good. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll I'll throw that over to you and just sort of yeah, you, you... I, I, it's such a big question, like, and this this is the issue that mental health is so individual. So you know, medication didn't help my dad, like, and that's not me writing off that medication will never help anyone. Like, I'm not stigmatizing it anyway. I know a lot of people that have hugely benefited from taking med you know medication. My dad never took paracetamol to cure a headache. He was super super holistic. So then when he's in that environment, the only routine that he had in that mental health unit was um, medicine time, like when it was. Um, I, I look at it and I spoke to many people. There's a, a great guy who's trying to open up like gyms in mental health units because a lot of them are closed because they're a danger to, to people that are suicidal. Um, and like, I just, I don't know. I just think if my dad was in that unit and he just had someone come to him and sort of put their hand on his shoulder and say, look, Neil, it's entirely up to you. But if you want to go for like a quick little walk or a quick little jog, I'll come with you. Like my, that, I think that would have benefited my dad a lot more than just being in a medicated kind of environment. Um, and the reason why I believe he was let down is one, like he should never have been let out on that day. My dad was let out on a physical assessment, not a mental assessment in a mental health unit, which is baffling. Um, and yeah, I just think that so much needs to change because Again, he never got help until he attempted suicide. Mm. And I see it all the time. It's like we, with mental health, it's the only sort of, you know, practice in a way that we have to hit rock bottom before we get any kind of help. Like it's, imagine that you went in and you had, I hate comparing it, but early signs of cancer. They're not going to tell you, you know what, you're right for now, but come back when it's like extremely bad. And that's just how we treat mental health. You go in with a bit of anxiety. It's very much you know what, you're all right for now. But you're not, because if you leave it, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse, it's going to progress into something more. And people aren't getting help until they hit that rock bottom point. Um, there's so much I can talk about it. But long story short, I just think there's, I've realized it's not going to be an overnight change. And we just need to offer people more alternative treatments rather than just medication or waiting eight months for CBT and, and therapy. You mentioned briefly before about sort of feeling a, a sense of guilt. Um, and I'm wondering um, what that was specifically. Was it, was it, I mean, I think you sort of touched upon it. Was it the idea that you felt you were responsible for, um, for, for his care that maybe you should have been a bit more forceful with, with a hospital or something like that? Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. Like I should have done something that night before. Like I should have, 
I was my my I was saying to myself, I need to take him in now. I need to take him to the hospital. I didn't. So there's a huge amount of guilt around that. Huge amount of guilt as well because it's like, obviously leading up to that, not when he broke down. Like the first 18 years of my life, like did I do something wrong that didn't help right. him? You know, and there's so much guilt around it. Um, and I've managed to kind of the thing that helped me move forward with was forgiveness, like forgiving myself, but also forgiving my dad. Um, and understanding that to be honest, like, you know, I was uneducated on it and knowing what I know now, I think I would have treated it completely differently, but I didn't know any of that now because back then, because I just wasn't, wasn't taught about it. So there was a huge amount of guilt, but I have managed to kind of let, let that go a little bit. Um, I want to, um, sort of sticking with this, this media thing, um, and well, sort of like with, you know, we're sat here talking about it now, um, there's there's issues around actually talking about suicide and how do you talk about it and you know, what's appropriate and, and and what have you and um the, the first one is so when i um when i interviewed um rory he was um it, he was reluctant to talk about the the methods involved and um spoiler spoiler alert, we're not going to talk about the methods um specifically now um i was interested in it because there's there's a difference in the the uh, methods used, say, for instance, by between men and women, and um, between younger and older people, um, and cross culturally as well. Um, now, f for me, I I'm of the opinion that um, not speaking about the methods is a form of sort of sanitizing the the subject. That when we sort of just use language like you know somebody took their own life and we don't talk about how how it happened it sort of enables the 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 onlooker the viewer the public whoever to picture it in a in a sort of nice way you know that, that someone just sort of this just sort of disappeared they, they were here one minute and they were sort of gone the next and my issue with that is um that sort of facing up to the brutality of it of of the of the situation that forces people to to sort of pay attention it would force people to take the issue a bit more seriously and yeah. i feel like almost like when it's sanitized it's almost like you can tell somebody you, you know you might be able to tell somebody that you're feeling suicidal and then all that's really at risk there is that you know maybe you'll just sort of fade into oblivion whereas um you know it's it's much more um well brutal than that in, yeah, yeah. It, no matter what the method and um i'm just wondering what your opinion is on that on on discussing the methods publicly because i believe there is research as well yeah. showing that it can sort of it can sort of inspire people to to, to commit suicide as well sorry again that's yeah that's another tricky thing isn't it this, this is the whole thing about it and, and that's for, that's force of habit that paul i'm no, afraid and again i do I'm, try to avoid it but you're completely right with it as well, because again, you know, like this whole commit suicide, I've said it before, we shouldn't say it, but I don't judge anyone for saying it. It's like, because it's, I don't think it's going to change it dramatically. It's just one little thing that we can change. Talking about the methods, if I'm brutally honest, I always used to say it, you know, I, all of my beginning talks, there's stuff on YouTube that like, I'll just say how he died. Like I'll, I'll talk about the method. Um, now for me, I'm, I'm acceptable talking about the method hundred percent. There's no, there's no triggers for me that if I mention the method, that it's going to affect me personally. So I don't mind saying it like in the book, again, it mentions a method, but the key thing is, is that you have to give a trigger warning for something like that. Right now, the reason why, um, I did a talk once and there's an amazing lady called Nina. She worked for Papyrus for a little bit of time. I'd met her a couple of times. I did a talk like brutally honest, talk about how my dad did it going to obviously how I dealt with it, et cetera. She pulled me aside and she was like, Paul, like, I love, I love your work, you know, connecting with you. Very, very complimentary. But she was like, but you need to stop talking about how he did it. And at first I was like, what's she, what's she talking about? Like, <laughs> I've, I felt that was a big, big part of my talk to dr drive that impact, like to literally say to people, this is how impactful it was. Um, and at first I was a bit like, mm, no, I don't really agree with her. And then I had a little thought about it. I did a bit of research, spoke to her again. I spoke to Rory and it was literally the way that she put it and Rory has put it, which is spot on, is me and you, I don't mind sharing the method, but like in a room, you don't know who's in that room. 
Right. So me talking about a method can be triggering for some people. And also at the same time, someone in that audience may be feeling suicidal. I've just given them a method that worked for my dad. Right. So that's more, you know, that could be a reason why they're going to do it as well. So I don't think there's anything wrong with us talking about methods when we know who we're talking to. But on a public platform, like standing in front of people or on the media, like getting it out to as many people as possible, it can be hugely, hugely triggering for people that have suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts. And we need to be more aware of that as well. Yeah. And well, the other the other sort of tricky dichotomy from the, the media perspective is whether or not to sort of report on this stuff. And again, it's sort of it's sort of the same problem. I mean, when it comes to thing, when it comes to people like um, celebrities, I guess it's sort of I guess it's sort of unavoidable. It's going to come out uh, um, eventually anyway. Um, and not just I'm not just talking about the methods. I'm talking about the, just the fact that somebody has taken their own life as opposed I, I, to. I think 100 percent someone need, they, they need to report that. Like this, this is the issue. There's so much silence around suicide. Like. Oh well, that's well, that's in, that, that, that's interesting you know. because you see, when I when I read um, when I read the news story about your dad, and particularly when I read your comment underneath it the day after, and everyone's everyone's got their own little fucking opinion on it, and then and then you're there like having to take all this shit in. I'm think, I'm I'm looking at these articles and I'm thinking, how is that newsworthy? That that mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, a local guy who's obviously you know going through some shit uh, has taken his own life, and then just just sort of slap it up there for everybody to um, yeah. be, be sort of like opinion vultures around. And again, it's a dichotomy because like, I think you were just about to say then it can't be brushed under the carpet. So I'm wondering what the, the balance is there. Yeah. I think, I think there's two things. I think, like, as you say, there's so much silence around it. So we definitely need to talk more about it, which is what I try and do is like, let's talk about suicide. You know, let's, not brush it under the carpet. The British culture is ter terrible at talking about grief anyway. Like I'm sure you you know that from from going through what your dad, you know, we just don't talk about death. Like it's literally, let's just brush it under the carpet. Um, and then when you bring in suicide to the mix, it's like, let's just brush that under the carpet as well. So there's just so much silence around it. So we definitely need to talk about it more. But just coming back to that point as well, I just I just had a, a thought. Um, a friend of mine from school, he was involved in a, he died in a car accident. And, um, he, you know, had a little bit to drink and, you know, was driving a bit too fast and, and, and sort of, you know, had an accident and it cost him his life at a very, very young age. Um, how old was he? He was 17, I think, or 18. And I remember that gets picked up on the local news as well, like on the articles, etc. And the comments there are horrible as well. <laughs> you know, it's like, or it serves him right, you know, or, you know, he shouldn't have been driving that fast and, and all of these kind of negative comments around that as well. So I don't know whether it's reporting on suicide or it's just humans. <laughs> it's just right. humans and how we're so judgmental very quickly without knowing someone's full story. And, um, you know, I think we're very quick to judge others and what we read and what we see on social media without actually knowing the full context anyway. So I don't, I don't know necessarily that's just about suicide. I think that's just, you know, how we typically perceive a lot of information that we see anyway. What's it like to do this as a thing on a, on a daily basis? Because, you know, I've, I mean, I've been doing this podcast for three years, about 90 episodes now or something like that. And, I, you know, I've only really spoken about um, suicide. This will be the third time specifically. But, you know, I've covered things like rape and child abuse and PTSD. And, you know, I'm only doing an episode of this, say, once, once a week, once every two weeks. And I find it fucking exhausting mm -hmm. sometimes. Um where and and that's from a, a, a you know I've I've got some distance there. I'm talking about this stuff sort of um, academically. Um, it's uh, you know I experienced like rape or child abuse or PTSD or anything. Um, but you're sort of in this, have experienced it directly, and and talking about it every day. And I'm just wondering, yeah, what's that like? <laughs> I do, it's a double-edged sword. Like, I love it. I, I love I love like helping people, and it sounds so cliche. Like you know, I'm 29 now, but if someone told me that at 19, that you got to help people, it's, I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just, no, you got to help yourself. You know, it's all about money. Um, but honestly, like helping me, helping others is a huge. It's a selfish thing because it helps me massively. Like hearing the response from people. Um, there's so much meaning behind my work now as well which kind of you know drives me forward as well like i've said a lot of it is to do with my kids now like trying to do something meaningful for them and seeing like how 
and just just enjoying it like I love doing it like I wake up every day when I'm I'm about to start some work and and I love it I love the process and I love what I'm trying to achieve with it but yeah 100% there's times where I just I just want to switch off and I've had to learn a lot as well like a lot of people like this is 10 years now and again like I always say people didn't really see the seven eight nine years prior to when I started to do a lot more around it but that was literally me trying to process it all get to a right place doing public speaking in in the fashion industry and the business kind of speeches I did to get over the fear of public speaking like all of that kind of then played a part in being able to now talk talk on stage about the story um and no one really remembers that um but yeah, some days I'm just exhausted. Like we were scheduled to do this, what, at eight o'clock one evening. And I come in from doing a talk. I sat down with Amy, my wife, who was watching telly. And I was like, right, I've got to do this podcast. And then I was just like, oh, I can't, I can't, man. Like, I'm just, <laughs> just drained. And I just messaged you like, I was honest, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted, man. I, I can't do it today. Um, so yeah, there's times where I have to switch off. There's times where I'm doing a lot of talks. And it's getting too much. And I can understand that now. And I realize that and I can switch off. Like I can say, I'm not doing that talk tomorrow. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. And I can detach myself from it as well. Um, but yeah. And sometimes as well, I just don't want to talk about mental health. Like I like going to the pub with my mates and talking about, you know, football and just general conversations. It's not that I'm avoiding the fact that if they want to have a serious conversation, I'll have it. But I do like just, you know, escaping from it too, because I don't want everything to be about the story and mental health. One of the other things that I find tricky to deal with as well is I get people emailing me a lot asking me for help, um, especially about, um, you know, issues that I haven't experienced personally. And um, what does your inbox look like on that front? And, and how do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, so this was the biggest challenge that I had. This was what, eight months ago, nine months ago, maybe a little bit more like 10 months ago. The more stuff I was doing on social media, it started to grow, it started to grow. I was getting more and more messages like, positive messages like you know wow i can really relate to this or this has really helped me but then messages of people saying i'm suicidal like or um i don't know if i can continue anymore and i'm struggling with depression what should i do and as well sharing me sharing their story like there's this thing about vulnerability. Like if I'm vulnerable and I share my story, you feel safe to share yours back. So a lot of my inbox back then and still is evolves around people sharing their story, which, you know, is 100% okay with me. But back then, I didn't know how to switch. Like I didn't know how to detach from it. So I'm in bed reading these stories, like feeling the pain, telling them to my wife and then struggling to sleep and then, you know, getting another one the next day and 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 these you know people saying they're feeling suicidal not knowing what i should do and taking all of that on board so the way that i deal with it now is i had to learn detachment like i had to learn that it's amazing that they're they're sharing their story to me and they're asking for help um but the way that i'm helping them is from what i'm putting on social media like what yeah. i'm actively doing it's not it's not I don't know. I have to detach myself from those stories and also from being the person that's always there to reply to them. Um, and I feel like I've got that now where I can say, this is me sharing personal experience. I'm not a qualified expert in any way. This is me sharing personal experience. If you message me, then there's other, you know, crisis support numbers that you should, you know, contact. There's other people that you should contact as well, but I'll try and get back to you as quickly as I can as well. Um, and I think it sounds, again, as I'm saying this, I'm like, you're such a selfish prick, Paul. Like, but <laughs> it's, I think that's just how we're wired. Like, but for me to best serve like my kids, my wife, my mum, my brother, my granddad, like everyone that I serve um, on social media and the work that I do, like, I'm number one. Like I have to be number one and I have to make sure that I'm okay here. Otherwise, I can't, I can't function. I can't help people. So yeah, I have to protect myself first. The other thing is about sort of talking about this all the time and being immersed in it. You, you mentioned it briefly before was this idea of um, susceptibility, a sort of a, a fatalistic outlook that, you know, this has happened to, to my dad. Is this going to happen to me? Um, I'm interested in the, the trajectory. I always struggle with that fucking word. Yeah. Um, of, of, of that experience, whether it's that's still something you, you, you struggle with um, and if not, how you sort of overcame that. Yeah, hundred percent. I was just thinking as you were saying that. So when it when it first happened, there was times about a year after that I was. I would never say it's hard to explain. I don't know whether I was suicidal. I think a lot of me being I was in a really really dark place, and 
I thought about it. But I think looking back at that, a lot of me was still trying to process how he could have done it. So maybe I was just trying to get in the headspace that he was in to see if I could understand it a little bit better. But I don't, I don't know. I, I can't process that. Um, but essentially, as time went on, that fear started to go away. But that fear is always there. And there was something that happened. When was this? A couple, couple of months ago where my granddad, um, he's, he's, he was 94 last week and my dad was an only child. Um, so my, my granddad lost my dad in March and then he lost my nan in April. So he lost like his son and wife within the space of a month. Um, oh, and like, he's never, I oh, know he's never really shown any emotion. Like he's like been through war and all that kind of stuff. Um, but essentially he's losing like his health. Like he's basically housebound. He has carers, but me and my brother are like, he's next to kin. Um, but again, like my brother had an accident two years ago, which um, has left him, you know, um, he's got his brain damaged and he's um, in a wheelchair. So a lot of the responsibility of my granddad comes down to me. And, and my mum also goes around there. Um, she cares for my brother 24 seven. My brother's mentally OK. He's still got the same shit sense of humor and all of that. So he's he's doing well. Um, but essentially, like he can't physically help my granddad. So where I'm getting to this is... Um, my granddad, like his memory's going and he calls me Neil sometimes. So that's my dad's name. Right. And um, we're talking about stuff and he's like, oh yeah, like, you, you know, your mum. And I'm like, that's Nan. And, you know, he, he gets me confused and sometimes he thinks that I'm dad. So then I'm like, I'm molded into dad because this is my whole thing that I'm sensitive like my dad. I was sporty like my dad. Everyone said I looked like my dad. I was my dad. And that was great when my dad was alive. Mm. But then when my dad took his own life, I was like, well, am I just going to be like him too in that sense? Um, and then there was things that like I've got two boys. My dad had two boys and he was talking about the boys. Like, Oh, do you remember when we did this with the boys? And I'm like, he must be talking about me and my brother. Cause it was just two of us as well. So, all of this was playing in my mind and I come home and I just burst into tears to sort of aim with my wife. And I was like, I'm just molded into my dad. <laughs> like, you know, two boys like this, that I'm going running, which was what my dad did, all of this. Um, but like she reframed it. And Anne, who the lady who helped me a lot, she's reframed it as well. And actually said like, look at it as a positive. Like your dad was an amazing person. Like you're not going to end your life because you've got two boys and your, your granddad's calling you Neil because he's 94 years old. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that still plays in my mind. Um, but I think I think I'm dealing with it a lot better than I am I have done in the past. Well, yeah, dealing with it's a sort of a an interesting question now that yeah, yeah, what, yeah. What, what, one I haven't one I haven't got writ, written down here. But like just talking to you now and uh, you know looking at your social media YouTube channel, super positive guy, always smiling, um, look like somebody that this is all 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 in the past and. Um, unfortunately, one of those people that maybe everyone else looks to, like that's you know, I that's what I want to be like, <laughs> not knowing the the reality of it. Because I've got this fear that my social media looks like I'm always depressed and sad. And <laughs> no, no, I mean, you know, I, the, the, no, that I, like I mean, the, me the message, the message there yeah, could yeah, be it. could be construed various ways. I guess. I, um, no, I get it. I get but, it a lot. Like you say, people say, you know, how did you how did you get over it? How did you? Yeah, I get yeah, that. but like you just, you know, it's it's not just this, is it? Like you you've been through the fucking ringer, all the yeah, stuff yeah. for your granddad and your brother and your and and your dad. Um, this person that I'm talking to now, I'm not if we're getting too deep here, but this person I'm talking to now, and the person we see on social media, how much of that is just Paul naturally? How much of it is putting a front on? How much of it is Paul having learned to deal? with all this mm. through, you know, either self-education or what, whatever it is. It's a really, really good point. Like the way I see it is I'm very transparent on social media, but the stuff that I put on social media is still very thought out. So it's very much like, I'm going to share this clip today. This is the message behind it. Um, and as you was talking about that, I've just realized that when I'm having those down days, I don't post. Right. So like, I didn't post for like, yeah three days or something like that which is, is which is good for me um but when i'm feeling down and moments where i'm struggling i just don't post on social media but actually yeah i should maybe post you know that i am feeling down and i think that's so important as well and someone asked me this question after a talk yesterday it's like about anxiety like do you still do you still get anxious i'm like 
Yeah, of course I do. Like, you know, there's there's nothing that stops the anxiety. I'm much better at managing it now. And I've managed to process it a lot better. It's not something that you just turn on and turn off. It's, you know, something that you're always going to constantly have to sort of, um, you know, manage in a way. Um, so yeah, it's a really good point. Definitely, I need to maybe be a bit more transparent in, 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 in how I'm feeling. And that's why I love these kind of podcasts, because it actually gets me to dig a little, a little bit deeper as well. And also as well, I always say it's free therapy, man. Like you're you're like a therapist right now. You're asking me all these questions. Yeah. And I'm like digging deeper, like, yeah, yeah, pulling something that happened and pulling this and trying to sort of make sense of it. So that's also why I love my job, because it's basically free therapy every single day. Um what's the so the the, the story the story you told me at the beginning, um uh, about your dad and about, you know, the how it felt the the situation at the time that's one story you know it's the story of um a guy that was really struggling um he took his own life it had it had the this effect on you it messed you up you didn't know what to deal with it there was guilt involved etc cetera, etc cetera. that's one story what's what's the story you tell yourself now that's um that's got you to obviously at a different place what's yeah. re tell me the story again but from where Paul is now? Yeah, so the way I see it now is I'm very, very lucky. Like, and that sounds strange, but but when I was struggling, I didn't feel lucky. I felt like, you know, I was a victim and this should never have happened to me or my dad or my family, et cetera. Um, but I'm super, super lucky because um, my dad was an amazing dad, like a great, great dad, like for 18 years. And even though some people have their dad for a lot longer than that, there are so many other people that don't even have a dad or, yeah. you know, totally. they're, um, they have a dad, but they're not a very nice dad. And they've been through a, a lot more from that. So um, gratitude massively helped me like actually reframing it and saying, actually, yeah, it doesn't, it's not nice what happened to us and what happened to me and my dad. But I'm very lucky that I had all of that in, in my life. Um, also as well, actually understanding that what pushes me forward is adversity. Like you said, like my, my dad, my brother, um other things as well i see that adversity is like building resilience like resilience is this keyword that they chuck around school and and you know in corporations now but i believe that adversity is kind of like that foundation of 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 the resilience that you have like channeling like what you've been through and actually kind of saying to yourself that if someone says a bad comment about you on instagram i've been through far more far worse than that to actually let that affect me now um so yeah, I kind of always kind of use those two um, in terms of where I'm at right now is I'm very grateful. And I know that the adversity that I've been through is actually what's building up this mental strength that can actually help me go and help others and, and continue to push forward. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you've read the book, um, Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. That's sort of the, oh, that's a brilliant book. That's, uh, he, he sort of distinguishes uh, anti-fragility from resilience in that, um, he talks about how systems and, and biological systems, economic systems or whatever thrive because of adversity. The, 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 mm -hmm. the analogy being a bit like the Hydra, you know, you, 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 cut, you cut the head off the Hydra and it grows two back sort of thing. And yeah, um, yeah it's a, br a brilliant concept that like I say is very distinct from resilience, which I totally agree has sort of been, um, com it's been commercialized the shit out of at the moment, like yeah. a bit like mindfulness and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, bit of a, a, a tricky question to, to end with, I guess here. Um, and that's, you know, you were talking about uh, this is, uh, you know, you wanted to help people. You wanted to, uh, this sort of creates meaning in your, in your life and um, you wanted to be able to, um, you know, sort of have an impact. The the, the tricky issue with um, suicide is that, I'll bring these up here, these. Um, so this is since, since 1999, suicide rates are up 33% in 20 years. And when you look at the suicide rates since the 1950s, um, barely any change really. And this is the one that I constantly, I, I can't quite wrap my head around. Um, so it's, you know, the, the rate was um, 21.2 per 100,000 people in uh, 1950. It went up to 21 to 21.5 um, in 1980. Went down in 2000 to 17.7, but now it's back up to 21.1. And I mean, those fluctuations are great and everything, 
But, I mean, we're, we're looking at a rate of 17.7, between 17.7 and 21.5, which you could say is negligible, that all the medication, all the research, all the mental health activism, all the books, all the self-help, all the YouTube channels, all the podcasts like this one are great, but they ain't doing fuck all. Mm. And um, I'm just wondering what you think of, <laughs> and, you know, there's going to be greater minds than us going to work on this, Paul, <laughs> about why why this is the case. Yeah. But I'm just wondering what you think of that. What are your suspicions of, of what's what's missing there? Why why isn't is nothing seeming to to to, yeah. to have any impact there's, there's two things to that question actually the first thing is and this is what i always say is those numbers are shocking yeah like suicide's the biggest killer of men under 50 suicide's the biggest killer of young people so this is the one that shocked me as well recently suicide's the biggest killer of mums with an under one year old oh I didn't so, know that. yeah so like new mums like biggest threat to their life is suicide um which is scary because you think the children that are being left behind mm. from that and how that's physically affecting them. But what's so important to know, and this is the negative part of this question, is they're recorded suicides. So like actual recorded suicides that are causing those numbers. My dad wasn't a recorded suicide. So my dad's not even in those numbers because my granddad didn't believe that it was a suicide. So the um, coroner wrote it down as an open verdict. Okay. Oh, so wow. there's okay. so many different open verdicts when it comes to suicide because sometimes there's like a question of was it suicide or was it not? Right. Um, you've also got people dying by that, al yeah. alcoholism, drug overdoses. That's not accounted as suicide, but for me, that's almost a, a personal self sabotage in a way. Um, you've got you know road accidents that are sort of uncounted for that are just not put through a suicide because they don't know whether they are or not. So the negative side of that is these statistics are so high, but they're likely to be a lot higher. It's like literally just tip of the iceberg. Um, the positive side of that is I don't think that anything's going to change quickly. So like what we're doing is very reactive. It's like we're seeing these statistics and we're trying to do something about it and we're very reactive. Um, but that's not going to spark a change overnight because I personally believe a lot of this starts a lot younger. Like if we, if we were like taught, and had much more understanding around mental health when we were younger, we're going to be able to process it and deal with it a lot better as time went on and we started to have these struggles. So for me, it's more of a next generation thing. It's like my granddad's generation were fouled, like my dad's generation was fouled, our generation was fouled. Um, my children's generation are looking like they're being fouled because it's still not being taught in schools. So are my grandkids the ones who are going to be that generation that has more of an openness around mental health. So I'm hoping that my kids, because they're still young, when they're older and they're starting to deal with a lot of these issues, that there's less of a stigma, there's more resources, there's more research, there's more help, so they can get the help that they need proactively. But the reason why I think that it's not changing is because still little is being done and we're very reactive still. So if we can really focus on the next generation, the generation after that, while still trying to help those that are struggling now, um, I just think it's going to take a huge amount of time and we just have to be patient with it. Yeah, one of the things I've been sort of um, thinking about and ju just sort of toying with this idea and, you know, I don't know how much truth in it, what, you, what maybe you think of it, but I, I sort of got this from recently that the, there was a guy f who was on uh, the program Love Island in in the, the UK, mm. um, which for um, people not in the UK, Love Island is basically... Lord of the Flies for extremely good-looking people. <laughs> um, they, they shove them on an island. Everyone's beautiful, and they just yeah, the the, the sexual tension and craziness. They just they, they let let it run rampant, and then we, we all watch it. But one of the one of the contestants from from that a guy called uh, Mike Thalassitis, he took his life um, at the beginning of this year. And then there was a lot of talk around it afterwards that, you know, he'd not been on the show for something like 18 months since, since he'd left. And there was a lot of talk about the responsibility of the, the, the Love Island producers and the people at ITV or whatever, their responsibility for taking care of him. And then sort of in the footnotes of, the, of all these stories was how his, you know, his best friend had died on Christmas Eve of that, of that year. Um, that he'd had to move in with his, his grandma, who, who was really close to. She wasn't very well. And then she'd passed away a couple of days before he took his own life. And he, he was uh, having to deal with money problems directly because he was looking after his choosing to look after his grandma instead of doing all the, the media work and what have you. 
And the thing that I got from that was that there seems to be a sort of, despite all the efforts of of, of mental health and activism and, and what have you, there seems to be this drive towards an outsourcing of love. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not making this accusation to particular individuals, particular families or, or whatever, but just that everybody's looking to everybody else to do something where it was when, you know, with, 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 with that guy from, from Love Island, it was like, um, you know, the, the, the Love Island producers, those people over there, they should have done something. Whereas instead of people looking at themselves and saying, well, what contribution did I make with all yeah. the, all the shit I was saying on social media and all the insults I was throwing out there. And, um, again, instead of, you know, we need we need more money for therapy or we need we need the government to do something. People aren't saying, what can I do? Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I, I'm wondering whether that's got every, it's a constant outsourcing of this person here is sort of somebody else's problem. And it makes us look great by going, this person's struggling. They need a therapist. They need the politicians to give them money or whatever it is. But I wonder how, you know, how much of it is that people aren't going, shit, this person's struggling. What can I do to help yeah. them? Or what can I, or what's been my contribution to, like, towards that? Um, I don't know. What do, what do you think of that? I think it comes down to personal responsibility of the actual person struggling as well. You know, oh, yeah. and, mm. like, you know, that, that was my dad's, that was my, my dad struggled because he was not taught about mental health. He obviously felt very stigmatized. He couldn't, you know, break his silence in a way. But it still comes down to my dad. Right. You know? And and the same with me. Like when I was in that really, really dark place, I talk I've spoken about it before, but not recently. Like responsibility was the thing that changed that changed it. Is actually saying that I am in control of this. Like I have to be responsible for this. And I can't other people could help me and guide me, but it's purely down to me. Like it's purely down to me how I move forward with this. Um so I definitely think there's really a lack of responsibility um within mental health still. Um, but the downside of that as well is when you actually are really, really struggling, like your mind's going to be telling you that you can't, you know, do anything about it anyway. So I think it, it comes it comes in two points. I think one, it's always down to the individual. It's down to the individual to have that personal responsibility to actually say, I'm going to push forward. I need to get better. Um, but at the same time, it comes down to we need different kind of support networks as well that they can tap into that can help them move forward too. Yeah, I think one of, I can't remember the guy who said this, quite a famous um, sort of suicide activist, was that the analogy he uses for for, for why people um, take their own life is it's like um, sort of hanging from a pole. And it's not like if you try and do that physically, I know this, I know it's a bit tricky always using the, these sort of metaphors, but, you know, if you, you, you're sort of hanging from a pole and um, eventually all the will in the world... Mm. You just, you, you, your arms are going to let go. Even if you knew you was going to plummet to your death, your hands yep. are going to let go of that bar. 100%. And um, yeah, and the, and the analogy he uses is it's just, it's, it's just the same at a sort of psychological level that people, people just can't hold on anymore. And, uh, yeah. and I think as well, like the way that I see it is, um, you know, my dad, but they say people that take their own lives, they don't want to die. They just don't know how to continue living. Yeah. It's like, it's very tunnel vision as Rory always explains that kind of perception of life closing in on you. And they, the only option that they've got is do I continue to fight or do I just give in? Do I end it? Um, and the thing that really got with me with my dad is the physical pain and other people that take their own lives as well. Like the physical pain that my dad endured, like me in the headspace that I'm in now, like I just could not imagine it. I just would never put myself through, through it. Um, but it goes to show that the mental and emotional pain that he was in was far greater. Mm. Like that physical pain was nowhere near the amount of mental and emotional pain that he was going through at that time. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that, yeah, we, we need far more understanding on it and actually realizing why people are in those situations and, and hoping that, you know, giving them the support that they need, but also realizing that it's their, their responsibility to get better too. Right, Paul. Well, I think, um, yeah, plenty for people to, to to chew over there um might have a few <laughs> all these episodes always end up with a few few emails landing in the inbox with people disagreeing with us um always <laughs> that's always a good thing um but particularly today after today's subject um i think would be good to sort of bring in the the, the quick fire questions um just to sort of raise the mood 
a little Let's bit, do it. hopefully. Play the music as well. <laughs> right, okay. So let's start with what's the best book you've ever read and why? That's a good one. I'm going to say Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Um, Susan. Is that Susan Cain? <laughs> is it Susan Cain or Susan Jeffries? I think it's Susan Jeffries. Is it? Oh, it's yeah, one of them but... ones I read a long time ago during my NLP and self-help days, I think it was. <laughs> the reason why it's the best book I've ever read is it was actually one of my dad's books. And um, my dad was very into self-help. He read a lot of self-help books. And we got rid of a load um, when he died. But there was a few that we kept. And I remember it was about a year or two after he died. I picked up this book. I read it. And, you know, looking back, that was a really, really iconic moment. Um, and, yeah, I just think I've... Always, always try and face fears as much as I possibly can. But the thing is, we face the fear, feel the fear, and do it anyway. Everyone always says, "Kind of, what's the book about?" And I'm like, "Just read the front cover." Yes, <laughs> it is one of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. If you could take the reins of department, if you could take the reins of power at the Department of Health, what policy would you implement to improve the mental well-being of the general public? Oh wow, politics! I'm terrible at politics. Um, well, I always say think very dictatorially. So just do whatever you want. Just be benevolent. Yeah, I don't know if I've got if I if I've got the ability to make mental health compulsory in schools, I would do that. If I haven't, because it's more health, I would give more options. So you know, we always talk about funding, but for me, the funding should be evolved around different options. So as you've probably realised, and I've realised, like m mental health is so individual. Like what helps you might not help me. So if we have these different options that you might try CBT, it might not work. But I've also got the option to go for NLP or talking therapy or mindfulness. Um, that's what I would really focus on is giving people more options for support. Okay. What's the best piece of life advice anyone's ever given you? My dad, believe it or not, lead with your heart, not with your head. Expand on that a little bit. So he always says you have to make decisions and do what you want based on your intuition rather than what your mind's telling you, which is why that that always stands out to me because of how my dad's life ended. Um, but yeah, I remember him saying to that, saying me, telling me that in, in the car after football training once. And it's always stuck with me. And I feel that I'm very good at leading with my intuition and my heart rather than sort of rationalizing it and thinking in my head. What mistakes do you continue to make despite knowing better? Self-sabotage in the fact of um, knowing that exercise helps, but then going like two weeks without doing it. <laughs> yeah. um, knowing that the chocolate isn't good for me and it makes me, and gluten and, and bread doesn't make me feel good, but still eating a pizza and stuff like that. What is a harsh truth you choose to ignore, but know you shouldn't? Oh, about myself? Um, well, just whatever springs to mind, I guess. That I tell people that they shouldn't worry what people think of them, but I still <laughs> worry what people think of them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. This is all of us so far, Paul. Don't worry about it. Um, okay. Um, oh, what do, you know to, what do you know to be true that everybody else thinks is bollocks? Everybody else. Oh, I'm a big spirituality help me a lot. And sometimes when I explain, I'm not super into like law of attraction and universe, but there's always, always, always pushbacks on that. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. So a fan, a, a fan of the book, The Secret? Exactly. Yeah. And, and that Jordan Henderson is the best central midfielder in the world. I don't know who he is. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that'll create its own controversy with the football fans. Okay, final three. What, if anything, keeps you up at night? Mm. What keeps me up at night? I'm a pretty good sleeper, to be honest. But um, fear of not achieving what I want to achieve to be honest like the only thing that kind of helps holds me back from sleeping or keeps me up at night is self-doubt of maybe I'm not achieving something as quick as I want to achieve it yeah I can relate to that one as well definitely okay outside of family and career what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfillment 
outside family and career. Yeah, and that includes the activism. So outside of those things. Uh, what's personally helped me? Does therapy be on there? Could I say that? Well, does that does um, what's brought you the most joy or fulfillment? The most that... joy or fulfillment? Mm. Traveling. Like and solo traveling as well. Like you know, my wife might not want to hear that, but I love. <laughs> I love honestly. I, I love traveling on my own. Like I travel on my own a lot f- for work, but one hundred percent. And again, it's very cliche, but traveling, going to new places, going on my own, eating in a restaurant on my own, like doing things on my own, has actually helped me a lot, and it's brought me a lot of joy and fulfillment. Oh yeah, that's a, that that's that's one for me. The traveling I could do, eating in a restaurant, table for one. <sighs> <laughs> still, it's, it's still yet to overcome that one. It's cool, I know we're running out of time, but the, the funniest thing I went to I went to Cornwall on my own camping. This was at a really point where I didn't really understand who I was and all of this. And I went to a place called the Minnick Theatre, right? And it's like an outdoor theatre in um in Cornwall. And I booked it for one. And I went to watch Babe the Pig because it was the only thing that was on. And it was me and about four schools and teachers. Wow. And everyone was like. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> he made the pig on his own. So that again is feel feel the fear and do it anyway. Yes, like, yeah, very much. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Okay, Paul. The final one, the big one. What do you think is the key to happiness? Hmm. The key to happiness. Oh, there's there's so much, but again, I think it's so individual to everyone. For me, the key to happiness is um, freedom. So, like emotional freedom financial freedom like freedom from a career that you don't enjoy and um I don't know naturally but ever since sort of dad passed I've always looked to gain that freedom it started with freedom from a job I'm going to start my own online business I can work wherever I want then it become financial freedom then it become you know freedom from the emotions the negative emotions as well so what I sort of see as 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 being happy is is being free Okay, Paul. Well, before I let you go, got to give you the um, chance, g- give you the floor to uh, plug away. So, if there's any links, books, websites, projects, anything you'd like to let the the, the viewers, the listeners know about, uh, please take a moment to plug away. Yeah, if you want to send me money, my bank details are zero. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty all over social media. Um, if you search P McGregor Com, um, Instagram, Facebook, or just search Paul McGregor, same with YouTube, search Paul McGregor. Um, book that's out as well called Man Up Man Down that come out in October and that really is kind of all of the story that we've shared in much more um, detail as well so that's the only other thing that I'd say go check out which is on Amazon um, at the moment right well as always we'll include links to all those the, the website social media and Paul's book um, links will all be in the show notes in the meantime Paul McGregor thank you very much for joining me all right, thank you man it's been a pleasure you're, you're a great interviewer um, and thank you for the therapy session Thank you very much.